Hello and welcome to the All Saints Basement Sessions in association with Create Britain GQ. My name is Christopher Tubbs and today I have a particularly famed composer, performer and musician. He is of course Mr. Gary Newman. How are you? I'm great. Actually. Welcome. Thank you. Um, now, I think it's probably a good idea to kind of start right at the beginning. Start back in uh, sort of West, West, not West London, but Western England. You're a, you've got, got the West in your blood, haven't you? I'm, I'm born in Hammersmith, so yeah. I'm West London is pretty close, yeah. So did you come from a kind of musical background, a musical environment when you were growing up? Not really. No, I had a cousin who was a guitar player, um, but only as a hobby. And I had an uncle that was a drummer. Um, he played in bands around Germany and so on. So I did a little bit of touring in, in his younger days, but not, nothing much. Certainly my mum and dad were, were nothing to do with music at all. So how did, you, how did you find yourself involved in it? It was a... Actually, it was more to do with technology. Um, when I was quite small, there was somebody on the television, I, I don't know, Hank Marvin, like one of that old block, yeah. and, uh, and I was really fascinated with the fact that his guitar was electric and you had to plug it in, it had dials and switches. So my initial interest in music wasn't actually m musical at all, it, it was a technology thing, which I, the fact that I got into synthesizers later on, it sort of it resonates with me quite a bit. So for quite a long time, um, music was a byproduct of my interest, which, which was right. electric technology. guitars and the noises that they made. So I was right. very much interested in noise and sound creation rather than music so I never really got very good still not I st I've never really learned how to play anything particularly well because I'm more interested in noises as opposed to Sonics. technique you know, right yeah no, somebody said play a you know play a blue scale in G not a clue <laughs> not a clue at all but you know make an interesting noise out of, the, of an exhaust pipe of a car and I'll be out there you know tapping it and doing all sorts of things and that's always been where I've come from, musically. I mean, in that in that respect, I mean, um, when did you discover sampling? Because that must have been of great interest to you. The fact you could sample anything. And well, we were doing that sort of thing way back before samplers were invented. You'd you'd make um, tape loops, so you'll go out with a little recorder, and um, well, you 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 find a bit of concrete, you'd drag it along the floor, and you'd record it into a whatever, cassette player, yeah. take that back to the studio, record it onto your quarter inch or whatever, half inch, whatever, mainly quarter inch, make a loop of it and then you would work out what the tempo was of that and then you'll clock your song onto that. This is all before MIDI and before any of the machines were talking to each other. So it's all very, Heath Robinson really, all a little bit sort of slapdash, but it did work of a fashion. You know, many times you'd see these big long tape loops running around the studio with bobbins and things hanging off them to try to keep tension. And it was doing pretty much what samplers then did very, very easily. So when sampling came along, for, for us, for some of the, the people that have been doing that sort of thing for a while, it was, it was put in a very difficult process into a nice little box and it all began very easily. But as a, as a way of working, we'd actually been doing it for years before that. So how did you sequence things? If you were, you know, because it was this pre-sequencer, obviously. Yeah. And you were just using analog sense. How, yeah. did, how did it all work? Was it literally, as you say, recording a... So how, how did you played it? Just yeah. literally, that was that. God forbid. <laughs> <laughs> what the? <laughs> you actually played it in. And if you got it out of time, you played it again. But normally, you know, you were pretty good at playing stuff in time. You, and you worked with real drummers sometimes. You tend to go in and out of time anyway, so you just went with it. But it was tricky. Once you start using sampling and things that were linked or uh, tied to a particular rhythm, right. then um, you needed a particularly good drummer. Yeah, so no, exactly. I was lucky, I've always been very lucky. I've had drummers that can lock onto it really well. The one I've got now, Richie, is amazing. Because everything is synced now. So, going back to the late 70s when you were, you know, 20, 20 years old in 1978, you know, yeah. the era of, era of punk, yeah. um, did, that, did that resonate with you, that period? I, I loved it for the excitement, uh, and I loved it for, this is punk, yeah. And I loved it for the opportunities that came with it. Uh, musically, not a lot, really. I liked the Sex Pistols. I thought they were pretty cool. But I didn't, didn't rate the others very much. I was never a Clash fan, for example, which is, yeah, sacrilege. But I wasn't. I didn't really get into that side of it at all. Really liked the Sex Pistols. Went to see them once or twice. Um, 
But it was as an opportunity, a time yeah. of opportunity. It was amazing. Everyone was. There were new record companies springing up in every street corner. You know, dozens and dozens of them. And I recognised that and saw it. And so I, I was in a. I started a punk band went all through that process to try to get a contract but for me it was a mercenary move it was a it wasn't a love of the music at all it was a, it was seeing it as an opportunity mm. doing it t to open a door and then when the door is opened you start to do what you want to do because those original demos came out later didn't they yeah yeah that's right did you i mean did you do you retrospectively kind of uh, other bands that you didn't feel at the time that you retrospectively like now from that period? Uh, no. no. <laughs> Consistent. Just the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, sadly, I have a very limited taste in music, which I'm ashamed of, because as a songwriter, you need to have a broader taste as possible so that you can bring in as many ideas as possible and, and filter them into your own music. And so I think it's, it's a limitation, clearly, having a, 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 a very narrow taste in music. But unfortunately, I do. I, I like... I like very little music, actually. There's a few bands that I really love, um, and the rest I kind of can take or leave, really. And I wish I wasn't like that. But that, that sort of, that kind of purity of vision, that sort of like, I don't know, like, I don't know call it industrial minimalism, but, but that it's almost, it, it's become iconic. It's become, you know, so uh, adhesively related to who you are and, and the way people perceive you, especially young generation of musicians now. Um, is it, does it feel strange to be uh, such a huge influence to so many of, of the you know, younger generations? It does really. You know, I, I think back to some early reviews that I got, which were pretty harsh. You know, um, like 0 out of 10 and you know, really bad, bad stuff. And so I've never thought of myself in that way. You know, I've always, I've always um, for the first half of the career particularly, I had a particularly um, difficult time with the press and music press particularly and so I've never um I've never thought of myself as being anything sp special at all you know my whole success um when it first came along was very much to do with with being in the right place at the right time and a couple of decisions that were made that they made a picture disc of of my third or fourth single I think the one the first one that did really well um and I was a completely unknown band then I'd had no success whatsoever so for the the parent record company to make that decision was quite a big thing to do. Mm. And I don't know who made that decision. I never did find out. But that really helped me to get to a certain level. And in Top of the Pops at the time, we're doing a thing called Bubbling Under, or they would take a record outside of the chart. And they chose me because my, my band was called Chilby Army and I thought it was an interesting name. That's luck. You know, so I became successful. Nothing, to, well, very little to do with the music, really. I was a gimmick. And so I never, be, so I get to number one and it's all massive and everyone's going, oh, you, know, you, you must be really big headed. No, not at all. I just thought, how lucky was that? I just felt lucky. Even our friends Electric, it's, it's two songs stuck together because I couldn't figure out how to finish them. Well, I think you're being incredibly modest. It's true though. But, um, but, I mean, <laughs> I mean how you, you know, at the time you had all this, these, these bands with this, this kind of fervent political anger, etc. you know. And, and you, you had this sort of almost kind of like, what seems to me sort of disaffected, kind of almost like isolationist kind yes. of vibe going on. Where did, where did that come from? Asperger's. I've got Asperger's, so it's how I re related to the world. I've got Asperger's and I was young. I mean, I was, I was 21 when it first happened, but I was quite um, naive and innocent. So effectively, I was like a teenager in a 21-year-old body. So I had all the angst and uh, problems that teenagers tend to have. Um, plus, I've got Asperger's, <laughs> so it's not a good combination, really. So how did, how did that you know, manifest itself? I, I was isolated and... Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> the but, whole image thing, that, that everything, that the music, everything that I did, the way I presented myself, it's all wrapped up in this feeling of being disconnected from everybody else, to not relating to people in general alone individuals but just not being comfortable with people it's and it's very difficult dealing with the press and you know having to promote yourself well, the funny thing about Asperger's is on a one-to-one -one level it's actually quite easy especially an interview because in an interview you're talking mainly about yourself it's when I start talking about something else I've 
crumble. Right. But when I'm talking about myself in situations like this, I can talk for England. I can talk for hours. <laughs> it's actually quite easy. But talk to me about something else, and I go, and I don't know what to say. I, I have a system. You know, I, I, I'm really bad with eye contact. And I, I know that if I, I count three seconds, and then I'll, five now, actually. Five seconds. Five seconds is too long. Three seconds is probably too short. Right. Three seconds, I'm not interested enough. Five seconds, I'm being weird. <laughs> and I can't. And, right, it's, I um, and I have all sorts of mechanical um, procedures that I've adopted over the years that, that get me through conversation and things like that. That's My wife is brilliant. She, she's got a brother, that's got Asperger's, and, and she's helped me massively, massively. But when she's not there, if we're out anywhere and she goes to the bar or goes to talk, whatever, whatever it is, I, I panic. I'm very quietly panic and I'm looking for her all the time coming back because she guides me through have that interacting. Fantastic to have that reference. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a sit in the corner, look down at the floor sort of bloke if she's not there. If she's there, she helps me to interact you know, at a, a reasonable level. So how do you find, you know, performing live in that respect in front of large amounts of people? That's, I mean, that's a different kind of communication, but how, how does, how does you know, Asperger's affect that? It's, it, it's not a problem. It's, uh, the, the larger the place, the easier it is, because the larger the place, the further away people are, the less eye contact there is, which is a real problem for me. Do you know, I've had things happen down the front that shows, uh, one particular well-known one where some girl took all her kit off and was running up and down the pit, and the band rule, I never saw it. I don't look here. I'm looking about a third of the way back. Round about where the lights and the, and the smoke merge into a faceless area. And that's where I'm looking. Because if I make eye contact with people, it throws me. Puts me, puts me out my stride a little bit. Right. So I tend to n not look too much. I'm, I'm better now than I used to be. But certainly in the early days, this was absolute no-go area. This, this bit down here. Now, you, you're someone who, um, you know, you've, you've been in the industry for 30 years. Um, and you've seen huge transitions in the recording industry. Mm. You know, uh, you, you kind of came up when there was still money to be made. What was it, what was it like as a, as a young man, you know, suddenly finding this sort of um, pop stardom and uh, being thrown on the road and having to create all these different mechanisms to deal with it? It's a bit tricky. It's a, it's, on the one hand, you know, it is the most amazing thing to go through you know, as an experience. It's just... It's everything you've ever dreamed of, everything. You, you know, you, you, I can't speak hardly enough. <laughs> Becoming a pop star is great, yeah. uh, but it comes with a with a price, which some people deal with very well, and uh, and I'm very impressed with those people that do that, and some other people struggle with it a bit more. Um, I've always had my feet very firmly on the ground, so I never had that those sort of star trippy problems. Luckily, because that would have made it worse. But on um, I think when, you're, when it happens very quickly, it's more difficult because you, you have to you adjust overnight, really. Um, when you go from being absolutely unknown to known everywhere, all over the world, in a space of two or three weeks, you know, that's a lot of adjusting to do quickly. I think it's worse if you're a single act rather than the band because it, it all falls on your shoulders. Um, I was with a very new record company that had no success before, so there was no one there to sort of guide you through it. I didn't have a manager even when it first happened. Really? So I was pretty much on my own. You know, you should talk to my dad about stuff. You know, what do you think? <laughs> dad, you know, who had no, ex no experience of it either. So um, dif difficult, um, but yeah, but amazingly exciting at the same time. So you know, it's, everything sort of balances out in a way. I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it. I did say some pretty stupid things, um, understandably perhaps, and I made some bad decisions, which everyone will. Uh, some of which have you know, hurt me for a long time, some of them haven't. But it's, I wouldn't change any of it. I take it you're talking about sort of uh, political affiliations and things like that, you know, supporting the Conservative Party. Yeah, um, I should, should never have said that. And I retired, apparently. I wanted to get out of it for a bit. I blamed Turing and all of my problems in dealing with it all. You know, I, I tended to blame Turing, so I said I was going to pack that up. And uh, I did for a bit. And I didn't realise the way it would be perceived at the time. Right. Because for me, it was actually a very sensible thing to do because I did need to. It was all mental, 
and I needed to just back off and go, whoa, you know, let's calm this down and see what's going on. I wanted my songwriting to be better and I couldn't because I was out on the road all the time and I really wanted to just concentrate on what was important. But I think the fans took that as if I just stuck my two fingers up at them and turned my back on them and I didn't think about that. It's a bit of a catch-22 though, isn't it? It's a, hard, it's a pretty hard situation to be. It's a classic situation, isn't it? Yeah. On the road, yeah. not being in the studio, not yeah. writing. And know. I understand now. I, under, I understand the way it was perceived. I even understand the press hostility to, to a little bit. And I know no, it's much better now. I don't have those problems anymore. But I think if, I was, if I'd been a bit more mature, then a lot of that wouldn't have happened. Athe um, atheism is another thing that's kind of um, uh, a, a quite, a, I think, quite a positive thing. Actually, has <laughs> been a foundation of, of of what you've done over the years. But how do you how do you view this this kind of you know there's been a huge uh, increase in popularity in atheism, especially in, in the UK, in in the last kind of ten years. Um, yeah. What do you how do you view sort of uh, Christopher Hitchens and this new wave of popularity for atheism? Of atheism. Oh, that's a good thing as well as I'm concerned. If, you know, if religion gives people comfort, then I have no problem with it at all. But it, it oversteps its bounds too many times and interferes and tries to influence and corrupt. And I'm very much against that. So the, the more people that see it for the rubbish that it is, mm. then the, the more realistic we are as a, as a people. So what kind of themes are you covering in your new album? Um, Dead, dead I was, I'm not allowed to, to sing about God anymore. <laughs> I've been banned from right, it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> I've, become, I've become a bit one-dimensional, I have to say. So I don't mind that. So this new one uh, is... There, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to write a sci-fi... Not sci-fi, sci-fantasy, which is different. A science fantasy novel, which is an ongoing, never-ending, silly project. But there's a few songs that have been um, derived from ideas for that. One could the Death and Rising is one of them. There's a couple of things about relationships. Um, there's another one, a big fallout of a friend of mine a few years back, which is unfortunately continued. Um, so there's one about that. Uh, so it's slightly more varied than previous two or three albums have been, which have been a bit anti-God. Stuck right. in that, really. Stuck in that. And uh, so it's out on September the 12th, and yeah. you're going to be touring it? Yeah, we're doing a mini tour, um, six or seven shows in September. Uh, and then I go back in the studio to carry on with the new album proper, which is called Splinter, which is coming out next year. Uh, and then I, I go out again in December for another mini tour to do like a second round of Death Sun Rising stuff. And then it's back in the studio, finish off Splinter. And then next year is pretty much devoted to touring the, the Splinter album right. everywhere, the whole world. So what's touring like these days for you? Is it uh, you know, a far more sort of urbane affair? Kind of, uh... I, I love it, actually. I mean, it's over the years, as I've become more experienced at it, uh, so the confidence has come, which I didn't have for the first few years. And it's just a very cool thing to do. You know, you, you're my band and my closest friends. So you're, you're in a bus, you know, a lovely bus, touring all over the world um, with your best mates, doing shows every night in all these lovely places. Yeah, there, it doesn't have a bad side. Fantastic. So many people talk about splitting up on tour, and I don't get it. I love it. I love it. So, how long have you been playing with with, with your current band for? The core of them. Oh God, it, 16, 17 years or more. There's a, there's a little bit of coming and going, obviously, but um, the, the main's yeah, a long time. Long so time. you've taken the you've taken the ride together, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I've never auditioned anyone actually. But the, uh, an audition for me is, isn't about whether they play, it's about whether we get on. So that I just invite people around the house for the afternoon and if we get on then they're in. You just assume they can play. <laughs> I never actually listen to anyone play first. Which uh, is not very clever really. <laughs> yeah. how, did you, how did you feel about being um, sampled by the, you know, by the sugar babes and this sort of recurrent interest? And... That was great. I, I, I had no problem with that at all. Um, I think a number of people, when it happened, a, a number of people spoke to me and they, they expected me, I think, to, to snag it, you know, and, and sort of not be happy about it. But I loved it. I thought it was a great track. I, I'm really pleased they used it. I thought the, the, my part of it was the music, obviously, because the vocal is somebody else's. It wasn't my original vocal. And I thought the track sounded great, you know, 20, 25 years after it was first made. So I was really proud of it. And then after that, 
or around about the same time as that. You know, you have people like Nine Inch Nails doing covers and Marilyn mm. Manson. That's right. Foo Fighters, all kinds of really cool people as well. So from a songwriting point of view, I was really proud of it because I had you know, Sugar Babes over here, um, you know, Armand Van Helden and blah, 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 right around to Nine Inch Nails over here. So I was covering a fairly wide spectrum of culture, of music. Yeah. So, you know, from a songwriting point of view, I was really proud of that. Really, really, still am. You know, yeah, happens no, it happens, happens now. Absolutely should be. And no, I've not taken it for granted at all. I'm still blown away when it happens. So, and of course, you're collaborating um, as well. You've got um, collaboration with Battles. Yeah, it's just come out. Um, started talking to them sort of towards the end of last year. They came to see me in Boston when we was touring America. Uh, and it's, you know, an idea that's progressing since then. And they're... they're um, uh, did a video for it a few weeks back in Los Angeles. It's just lovely. It's, it's nice to work with people that are kind of inventive and doing something about the mainstream. If you're going to do a collaboration, that's kind of what you're looking for, really. And what about, uh, you know, on the sort of the, uh, the leisure end of things? Do you still fly? No, not now. I've got three children. Uh. Um, and I was an air display pilot, you see, so I used to do low-level aerobatics and all that. And you teach that for a bit. I wasn't a, what they called an evaluator, which means I would watch other people and make sure they're good enough, then I'd have to write their ticket, so to speak. So I got quite good at it towards the end. And I loved it very, very much. But, but pretty much every friend that I had, except for a couple, were all killed in different crashes. And it changed you know, what, what was very exciting. And, and um, you felt part of an elite. And it was a very ego massaging thing to be a part of. And I did love it. It, it went from that slowly to being something quite sad, actually. And you miss people. You think, oh, yeah, yeah. And you look around for people and think, oh, no, he, he went down. And then Gemma didn't want me to do it anymore because of a particular accident of a friend of ours. And um, it all just went away. And then the children come along and I thought it was just of course. too dangerous, really. I do miss it, though. I bet you do. Yeah, miss it. Yeah, my dad was a, was a pilot until uh, the, the, we came along and and uh, he had to dump it as well. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. he was miserable for years about it. <laughs> it's a big part of your life, but for me it's an obsession, an absolute obsession. You know, there was a time in the 90s when the music career was doing not, not very well at all. I was dead and buried, really. But the flying side of things are doing better and better. I, I was doing more and more air shows, becoming more and more well-known, more as, as a pilot than as a, as a musician. And where your kind of self-esteem is sucked away, as something fails. So it was being built up for something I was doing well at. And, and it's sort of that balance thing again. And for, for a while, it was really important to me. It sort of kept me mm. feeling positive about life and, and so on. So then as the music went to, into this renaissance period that I'm kind of still enjoying at the moment, uh, sort of flying backed off a little bit. And balance was maintained, as they say. But it was... It's an amazingly exciting thing to do. I mean, you're upside down, 50 feet off the ground, and, you, and your face is doing that. And you make a mistake, and you're dead. Yeah, yeah. The worst that happens on stage is you get embarrassed. <laughs> That's it. That's the challenge. Not much of a challenge, really. But, you know, I used to fly World Tour airplanes as well. Yeah, so a real handful. Good fun. Good fun. What's, uh, you know, you've always had a very distinct, strong look, you know, fashion-wise, and how much do you think we have? Some good, it. some bad, yeah. <laughs> hey, we all have our moments. <laughs> but, um, you know, how important has that been to your, to your kind of, I don't know, your, your brand? I hate using the word brand, but you, you, you know what I mean. Mm. Do, you still, do, you, do, you still take, do you take an active interest in fashion? Um, less now, probably, than I did when I, when I started. Yeah, when I started, it was a vitally important part of what I was doing. Um, I used to see the, the way you looked in conjunction with the on-stage performance, the lighting, the music, the covers, the album covers, even what you said in the interviews, all um, integrated. Like, like the cogs of a machine, they all have to be working and going in the right direction. If one of those doesn't work, it jams up the whole machine and it all falls apart. Uh, and I felt very strongly about that for quite a few years. Um, these days, I, I, I have a similar kind of art. I still think it's all very, very important, but my look has become more, more generic than a particular image for each album. I used to change image for every album that I made, and after a while that became a bit tedious for a start, and 
arguably unnecessary, as the music itself found its sort of direction and so on. This is more the last sort of 10 or 15 years, I suppose. So it, it's still very important to me, but I, I no longer go from image to image, from one album to another. Thank you so much for uh, coming to talk to us today. Pleasure. I Pleasure. really, thank really you. appreciate it. And best of luck with the, um, the new record and, of course, the new tour. Yeah, thank you. Gary thank Newman, you. thank you very much. Cheers, thank you.